This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi friends. Today we'll discuss about a case wherein posterior capsule tear happened during surgery and let's try to understand uh, what was the stage at which it happened, why it happened and eventually how was it managed. Just watch the video till the very end to understand the finer nuances of managing the posterior capsule tear and doing an antivitrectomy and a topical anesthesia. He's a 60-year-old man who has this a nuclear cataract. Nucleus grade is around grade 4 and uh, clinically there is no evidence of any pseudo exfoliation. Pupil is very well dilating, so this should not be a much of an issue. So the excess is done. It's of adequate size. Horizontal chopping of the nucleus is being performed. Looks all right. The nucleus is divided into multiple smaller fragments and then emulsified in a routine way. The nucleus emulsification was quite uneventful. Nothing about that. The epinucleus is then visco expressed out of the eye. The cortex aspiration is being done in the routine manner. things are going very well according to the plan so no surprises the last bit of cortex is aspirated out as is customary i am cleaning the posterior capsule by gently blowing it with bss at this point i realized that the posterior capsule is quite bulged up that is quite convex uh, probably because of a positive pressure most likely because of some amount of fluid misdirection which has happened during the course of the surgery But nevertheless this is not a very uncommon thing so it shouldn't be a problem uh, but anticipating an issue here i'm using sodium hyaluronate instead of the usual hpmc to implant the lens here because it's a heavy viscoelastic is going to push back the posterior capsule quite well enough unfortunately there was an issue with the loading of the lens and uh, as i'm trying to implant the lens i realize that the lens has been loaded in the not the right way it is flipped inside and i'm trying to correct it by rotating it and at this moment i feel that there is lot of uh, manipulation which is being happening inside the bag and the haptic is literally touching the posterior capsule and this doesn't really look good but eventually the lens could be placed inside the bag and uh, the haptics are oriented in the appropriate way at this point i still thought that uh, everything is all right so now is the time to remove the ovd I'm going in with my irrigation cannula just trying to irrigate out the OVD both behind the lens and in front of the lens. I realize that the posterior pressure has increased now and as I'm trying to tap the lens back I can see there's a, a thin line which is fluttering around the peripheral part which looks to be unusual. As I'm trying to press the lens back the peripheral line which you're seeing blows out and an obvious posterior capsule tear is visible now so what was happening then was you know the pc tear was already there since the vitreous phase was still intact the tear was not very evidently seen but because of pressing the lens back the vitreous prolapse happened and the posterior capsule tear has opened up now the equitable posterior capsule tears can be challenging sometimes as was in this case so now we have posterior capsule tear and the shape of the tear indicates that there is definitely vitreous prolapse which has happened already so i need to manage this case now let's see how things go about and what are the things which i do the first thing i need to do is to calm the patient down and the surgery will prolong for a few more minutes now so since the patient is on topical i am supplementing with a few drops of intracameral lignocaine just to ensure that the patient is more comfortable as the surgery is being prolonged a verbal reassurance is given to the patient that everything is fine and it's going to take a few more minutes that's all although the vitreous prolapse seems very obvious now i would still like to confirm it by using diluted tramsin acetate the advantage is that it exactly shows me the location of the vitreous fibrils and also the extent of uh, vitreous which has prolapsed out here 
you can see that couple of fibers have already entered into the main wound which is not very obvious beforehand. The most important parameter when you're trying to do an antivitrectomy is the bottle height. So whenever we have a posterior capsule tear, the first thing we need to do is to decrease the bottle height. We don't want the fluid to gush in with force because the moment the forceful fluid gushes in, there is every chance that we are going to enlarge the posterior capsule tear film still more and also prolapse the vitreous out. So this is probably the most important parameter. Watch out for the bottle height. In this case, the bottle height is set around you know, 40 centimeters, which is extremely low compared to the 90 which we typically use for irrigation aspiration. The cut rate is set at very high, about uh, 2500, which my machine allows here. And the aspiration flow rate is extremely low with a moderate vacuum. The vitrectomy takes just a few minutes. We don't want to do an extensive vitrectomy. We want to take care just of the prolapsed vitreous, which is here. And the majority of the vitreous seems to be cleared out, but I feel that the pupil is quite oblong near the incision and I suspect that these two fibrils could be still a vitreous fibril here. I'm instilling few drops of intracambral pilocarpin, which helps me to delineate the fine fibrils a little bit better. These two fibrils are taken care of, but what I had not anticipated was at this area. Look at this area here. There's a very tiny peaking of the iris, again suggesting that there is a strand which is coming out into the side port here. Again, I'm going to use Tramson acetate, delineate the fiber and then perform a little bit more of an antivitrectomy. A lot of questions always will be asked that why we need to use a Tramson acetate so many times. The reason is simple. It's extremely difficult and to find out these fibrils, especially in a dilated pupil. And it does have a knack to fool us. So we need to be extra cautious and repeat the use of, you know, Tramson acetate. And even in some cases, you know, using pilocarpin like this in this case, if I had not used pilocarpin, probably I would have still missed this uh, with small vitreous strand here. It's really not worthwhile to close the case early and find a vitreous strand which is extending onto the wound on the next post-op day. So it's worthwhile to spend a few more minutes during the surgery itself and to ensure that it is meticulously done here. I'm just stroking the iris with the Sinsky just to bring it down and to ensure that, you know, I'm not missing out any vitreous fibril. Without removing the irrigating cannula, I'm hydrating the uh, side port incisions. Once it is done, the main port is also hydrated. I'm just checking the pressure, whether the pressure is alright. Patient was very anxious, he's moving all around his eyes, but fortunately, things went on well and uh, hopefully he should do well tomorrow. In the immediate post-op period, I'm expecting some amount of a raised pressure so I'm putting him on topical anti medication of Brimorin and Timolol and let's see how things go in the first first stop day. So these are the first day pictures. He seems to be doing okay. The pressures are monitored and they will be taken care of. The little bit of coronary edema which is there is going to clear off in a couple of days. That should be fine. His vision seems to be alright. To summarize, every step of cataract surgery has to be a foolproof. So in this case, we had a misadventure in the form of the lens not behaving well inside the bag and the haptic of this multi-piece lens probably perforated the equatorial part of the PC during its manipulation. And that could be the reason why we had a tear at this position. The tear was not obvious in the immediate period after putting the lens inside because until then the vitreous phase was still holding up but during the viscoelastic removal, the antihaloid rupture happened and the vitreous prolapse ensued. That was the time when actually the equatorial PC tear became visible. Obviously, even though the patient was under topical anesthesia, just supplementing with few drops of intracameral anesthesia and using the right parameters of low bottle height and adequate cut rate, we could manage the prolapse vitreous in a decent way without having much of an issue. Well, if I had a second chance, I would probably have done a couple of things differently in this case. During IOL implantation, the moment I realized that there was an issue with the loading of the lens and the injector system, I would have withdrawn at this stage and reloaded the lens again, probably with a different injector if need be. 
I would have chosen safety over confidence. Number two, at this moment, when I realized that there is suspicion of an equatorial posterior capsule tear, I would have been a little bit gentle in tapping the lens down and also very slow with the irrigation. This would probably have prevented the anterior halo rupture and vitreous prolapse. So these are the two things which I would have tried if I had a second chance and hopefully the outcomes would have been different. That was it. Thank you for watching and hope you found this video helpful.